So welcome to Debt Free Life. Today is uh, June the 24th. We're at 5.40 p.m. Uh, we're here to discuss the Debt Free Life program from, uh, that's being offered by Symmetry Financial Group and Quility. Um, this, is a, this is meant to be an overview of how the program can work, what it can do, how you can use it, and how you should use it. Um, this, is not to meant, uh, this is not meant to be a one-size-fits-all program. It is never the case. Every single program that we, that we do is unique to each individual. Um, so <clears throat> uh, one of the first things I want to do is I want to discuss what debt-free life is, it, what it is not, really. It, it is not a, um, a debt um, negotiation program. It is not a debt consolidation program. It is a debt elimination program. And if you were here earlier, we were showing the, the US debt clock, which has grown since in the last 30 days, or actually last 45 days, it's grown over $240 billion in, uh, in less than two months. And um, we also showed what the, the track is, the current track of where it's gonna be. Um, in 2025, which is over $50 trillion in debt. And that's what the U.S. gross domestic product of only $22 trillion. So basically, where the country is going, where the, the debt is being spent, um, we are on track to get to the point where we have two and a half years of debt. Um, that's if every single person in this country worked, didn't keep any of the money, gave all the money to the federal government, let the federal government spend it. That's where we're going to be in 2025. So um, that's not fun, and, um, it, and it's not saying that any either side of the aisle is right or wrong. Um, I think they're both wrong. So uh, if you have a if you have a concern about the debt, the first thing you can do is get out of it, which is what this is about. The second thing you can do, not to pound the political drum, but say something to your politicians. Let them know that you're unhappy. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and start the uh, the program. So debt free life, what is it? It's a it's a it's a oh yeah, a couple of things. If you don't mind, um, if you're not muted, mute yourself. And if you're not, when we're until we get to the Q and A side, if you would go ahead and uh, go ahead and black out your cameras as well. Um, that way, it's, it will be less distracting for people that might look at this later on. All right. So <clears throat> debt free life is a program that's uh, it's a proprietary program from Symmetry Financial Group. It is uh, using a life insurance product in a manner that has been known about for a very long time, uh, that the richest people in this country have been using for a very long time. But the most of us, the rest of us, the blue collar workers and the, and the white collar even, didn't, didn't really know how to use these programs and didn't know how, to, um, how well they can perform for us. So what we've done, what Symmetry's done is we've taken um, the, the time and effort to create software, to create solutions, to create a plan and a program that is easy to implement for just about anybody and get you to the point where you're not so concerned about whether or not you've got that $2,000 a month mortgage payment and even less concerned that you're going to have it for 30 years. And you're more accustomed and you, through a debt-free life program, you're going to be accustomed to having zero mortgage payment in probably nine years or less. So let's move forward and talk about debt-free life a little bit. So the first two questions that we, that we learn to ask as people that are potentially offering this to clients, uh, or maybe the, the reason why you're here, you've heard these two questions, is are you 100% certain that you're gonna have a great retirement? Do you have some doubt? I think everybody has doubt. And the second question is, if we could show you a way to get uh, rid of all your debt, including your mortgage in nine years or less, would you be interested in listening? And obviously, if you're here, then you're interested in listening. That, that second question, actually, what I'm finding, though, it's, it's, um, it's not completely accurate uh, because it's not nine years or less. What I've seen is 15 to 27 years early. So if you're on a 30-year track to pay off all your debt, including your mortgage, there's a possibility, depending on how well you fund your program, you could be out of debt in three years. So um, those, I've, I've seen one work like that. And uh, I know the one that, that my wife and I did for us, we went from 20, I think six years down to six. So it, it can work and it works at varying degrees for different people, depending on what your debt load is and how well you're able to fund the program. But let's go ahead and move forward. So this is what is a good uh, pie chart representation of what the average American household's income and finances looks like. 
uh, about 34 cents of every dollar we spend goes to pay interest. And that's because we are uh, addicted to debt. 40% of what we pay uh, of every dollar is paying taxes. And that's because our government is addicted to debt. 23% of what's left over is what we use um, to live by. That's what we use to pay our power bill, gas bill, light bill, pay our mortgage payment, pay the car payment, um, pay our Netflix bill, take the kids to summer camp, whatever. But that's where that money is. And then we have this thought or idea that if we save some money, it's going to be enough for, for the future. And most of us, unfortunately, are going to be relying on Social Security as an income stream. And again, prior to this conversation's recording, we were looking at the debt clock and you know, the uh, Social Security Administration is going to be bankrupt in 2010. And unless they do something to fix it. So if you um, are banking on the Social Security Administration being able to provide you income for the rest of your life, uh, you need to reevaluate and you need to make plans for something else. This DFL program can be something else. And it's really never too late to start one of these um, because that last sliver that we're talking at the top there, that 3%, that's not enough to retire on. What you're, what you're talking about is you're, you're accustomed to 100% of your income level right now. And if you're only saving 3%, even with interest, you might get to 10% or maybe 15% from that 3% core savings. It's not going to be enough to retire with, not even with Social Security. Okay, so make plans. Glad you're here. Debt-free life can help you with that, with, with that problem. Um, we as Americans make plenty of money, and this is this slide is designed to show you and illustrate that. $2 million is a lot of money over time uh, in a lifetime of an individual. And if you spend the money efficiently, you should be fine. Most Americans don't spend money efficiently. <clears throat> and uh, because of that, that 3% of that $2 million, when they save that 3%, they've got $60,000 when it comes time to start looking at retirement. and. Obviously, $60,000, if you're accustomed to making $50,000, $70,000, $100,000 a year, that's not going to last long. And it's, it's certainly not enough. And this absolutely <clears throat> is not the American dream. The amount of taxation we have is not what, the, what our founding fathers had in mind. And this is, um, this is not a tenable position to be in for our country and for us. One thing we can do to affect that, though, is we can, we can eliminate our debt so that we're not going to be so... Uh, strapped or reliant on what is probably not going to be as rosy a retirement as we think it is based on Social Security not being there. So this is the traditional approach when we're looking at debt elimination. The, you're going to talk to debt counselors, debt managers, debt consolidators, and they're going to give you these solutions. They're going to tell you to work hard get a second job, spend less, save more, refinance, consolidate, every single one of those fails. The only one that they're gonna tell you that's gonna work consistently of elimination of debt is gonna be a debt snowball. So that is a, a financial tool that we incorporate into our DFL program and it works and it works like a charm, okay? But you have to be disciplined with it. We'll talk about that in a minute. So our better way <clears throat> is a DFL solution. Eliminate your debt in nine years less. Eh, eliminate your debt 27 to 15 years earlier. I like to I like to say it better like that. So where we want to do is we want to get you from the left side of your screen to the right side of your screen. Get you from the point where you're saving not three percent of your income, two hundred and sixty thousand dollars over the lifetime of someone who earns two million dollars in a lifetime. We want to get you to fifteen percent. It's a whole lot better position to be in. When you've got six, when you've got three hundred thousand dollars in the bank for your retirement versus only sixty, whole lot better. How do we do it? We're simply changing the way you spend money and making you spend it, or putting in a, putting an opportunity for you to spend it in a more efficient manner in front. Of you. We're going to reduce the interest rate, not the interest rate. We're going to reduce the interest that you pay. We're going to reduce your taxes. We are going to reduce your tax rate, and then we'll talk about that in a minute too. We're going to change the way you spend money so that your cash flow changes. So none of this would make any sense. And this certainly wouldn't work if we told everybody, yeah, you can do this, but you got to spend $5,000 a month. And you're going to, and nobody's got that. Nobody can do that. So our system doesn't, doesn't rely on you going out and getting another job or really spending a lot more money or, or any 
on your 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 retirement or or your debt elimination. We're we're not going to cause you a, another bill. We're going to just change the way that you spend money and put you in a more efficient spending pattern so that instead of that 23% of the money that you've got left over at the end of the month, you've got 33%. That's not a 10% gain. That's a much larger gain. And what that means is you're going to go from instead of having $1,000 a month at the end of the month, every month, if you've got that, to having $1,400, which is that $400 is different. That's, that's a lot. That's going out to a you know, dinner a couple of times, one of the movies, maybe if you can get into a movie house these days, um, maybe buying that new larger screen TV or whatever. The $400 makes a difference. So how do we do it? We do it by reducing the interest you're going to pay to your lenders. And the way we do that is by getting rid of those debts quicker so that that interest can't nickel and dime you to death. We get rid of all your debt if it's possible, and most of the time it is, in nine years or less. We're going to reduce the taxes you pay over time. If, if you get to the point where the money that you're taking in retirement is not taxable, that's huge. So if you've got $100,000 in a 401k, you're going to owe $38,000 in taxes by the time you've taken it all. If you've got $100,000 in one of these DFL programs, you're going to pay zero in tax when you take it all. That's the key difference. So it's a 38% swing, at least, depending on your tax bracket. We're going to improve, improve your cash flow, which is what we just talked about a minute ago. We're going to make it so that you've got more money. That's my tax rate. We're going to make it so that you've got more money available at the end of every month. And we're going to allow you to retire with a tax rate income. Of all the different kinds of incomes that you can have when you're retired, the most tax favored is going to be a tax exempt income. And that's what we're looking at doing. So one of the things I said earlier on is that this is not new. This has been around for a long time. As a matter of fact, one of the carriers we use has been around and doing this since, uh, since, the, ninth, since the, the early 20th century, since 1904. They were, they were one of the original companies to offer this program. And they're still doing it. And when we look at other alternative programs that have come out over the years, and I'm not going to name any names because I don't want to send you that direction, but there are other programs that are similar to this that are out there, but every single one of them has an Achilles heel. And one of the, when we did a comparison of these other programs and figured out which ones were failing and why and how often, the biggest reason why they failed is because they didn't plan for the unexpected. They thought that the, the future is bright and rosy and we're never going to have another downturn in the market. Or for one of the most popular programs out there, we didn't make the, uh, the assumption that the market was going to have 12 years of solid gains and not have a loss. We did not, we, we saw is that um, maybe someone got sick and wasn't able to work for a year and that threw those programs off. Maybe someone died early and that threw those programs off. So the the way we worked this out was we made it so that there's an emergency fund in all these programs that we do. The emergency fund is about 20% of what your total fund shows. It's there, it's hidden. We don't want you to get to it easy. We want it to be used for what it's supposed to be used, which is an emergency, okay? Not a, I need a new jet ski emergency, a my transmission just dropped and I need a new emergency. I need that now, that kind of emergency, a real emergency. So. That's also one of the cap of the, the Achilles heels of this, if you will, and that unfortunately, a lot of time you've probably heard those stories about people that have won the lottery and they've been exposed to large sums of money that they've never had in their life. And then all of a sudden, two, three years down the road, they're they're broke again. And that's because they don't know how to manage money and they don't know how to use money. And with, that's the, the one that I've been able to see. That's the one problem with this program is that the program works so well and it creates such large sums of cash that the temptation to go out and use the money and you know, maybe you get that thought in your head, oh, I worked my tail off this month. I deserve a vacation. I'm going to feed you because I've got $15,000 cash sitting in my DFL program. No inappropriate use of the money. That's what will cause the program to fail. You have to use the money for the right reasons. So looking at this a little bit closer, um, we talked earlier about um, having a tax-favored retirement. 
and the different types of tax favored retirements are. 401 is tax favored because you're not paying tax for it up front. Uh, a Roth 401 is, is tax favored because you're not paying tax on anything other than the, uh, the, the, the gain when you, when you touch the gain, uh, maybe. And then the most kind of tax favored environment is one that you don't have any tax at all. So when you, when you run the numbers of those three types of solutions side by side, tax, tax deferred, um, tax exempt, um, using the same investment, the same rate of return, the same length of time, the same interest rate that you're going to earn over time, and the same tax rate that you're going to pay on taxes when you have to pay tax on those funds. Hands down, the, the DFL program works the best. And this is not magic. It's just math. And the nice thing about this is we don't care. We're not, we're not linked to the market either. We don't care whether the market goes up, down, or sideways. It's not going to affect our return. It's certainly not going to affect uh, any taxes that we owe, and it's not going to affect the end result of what we what we end up with. So that ten thousand dollars over twenty eight years is going to turn into sixty six thousand. That's huge. What happens if that ten thousand dollars was not just ten thousand dollars in one year? What happens if you did that every year? That's even bigger, right? It's crazy stuff. All right. So, <clears throat> like all financial instruments, there are phases of use, and the DFL program works in three primary phases. Number one is maximization, number two, accumulation, number three, distribution. So, what are these three phases? So, the maximization phase is where we're going to maximize the amount of money you're putting away for retirement by as quickly as we can eliminate the tax exposure that you have, the interest exposure that you have, and the debts. That's what the maximization phase tries to do, does it as quickly as possible. The accumulation phase is the, is the period of time from when you're out of debt, but you're still working and you've got money coming in and you're still funding your program. And that's really building your nest egg. And, it's, and the reason why these programs work so well is because in that maximization phase, we are really, really leveraging debt. We're turning debt on its head and making the debt work for us to eliminate it and then using it again in the accumulation phase to grow it. And then finally, we get to the distribution phase. That's the holy grail. That's when you're retired. And all of a sudden now you've got that time and you've got the money and you can go make that emergency jet ski purchase. And the emergency is simply because you want one. And it doesn't matter because at that point, the game's over, the debt's not there. The amount, the amount of money you need to live on is significantly reduced, but the amount of income you have is higher than what it would have been. And that's the beautiful thing about these programs. It really, really puts you into the into the um, into the position where the the market can't affect you, the taxation can't affect you. You're there's no lender that can affect you. You're immune, and that's where we all would want to be, or should want should want to be. So, I mentioned earlier this is not new. This program, this concept, which which is actually infinite banking coupled with debt snowballing. Has been around for a long time. Ray Kroc used it when he started his first 13 McDonald's. Doris Christopher used it. Warren Buffett still uses it with Berkshire Hathaway. Walt Disney did it when he, when he started Walt Disney World. And these are all people that understand the effect of compounding interest and the ability to compound, not just compounding the compound, which is, it's a, it's a convoluted idea, but it's, it's, it's super, super powerful. And these people have been able to, in the past, use it and leverage it. And we're trying to teach you how to do the same thing. Only thing different being is that we're doing it with a program that was built from the ground up specifically for this purpose. And, and all the cases that you see before you, they all had to go to their insurance company and put a process in place where the insurance company would mix and match different pieces to try to affect what we have already in place. So moving on, um, again, this is just kind of a summary of where we, where we go to, to make you spend the money more efficiently. I'm not gonna read them off. These are just common bullets that we talk about all the time, but primarily it's just each one of these things can, conspires um, or and contributes to your ability to, to use your money more efficiently. And um, we'll talk about that in just a minute because I'm going to show you a real illustration.
So um, these pictures that you see there, those are from people that we we done this program early, early on. Those are from back in 2019, those three families. And what we're seeing these days is the amount of debt, even in just three years, it's significantly different than what it was even just three years ago. And um, and those hundred thousand dollars, seventy three thousand dollars, eighty four thousand dollars, I haven't seen that in a year. I haven't seen where the only debt that someone has that does one of these programs is is seventy three thousand dollars, and um, it's crazy. So, how do you do this? Well, let's first off, you have to understand how you spend money right this minute. So, how do you spend money right now? You make money. That money goes. Whether you're a W-2, W-4, 1099, self-employed, doesn't really matter. You make money. That money comes to you in whatever format it comes to. And ultimately, it ends up in your bank account. Whoever you bank with, it doesn't matter. Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Citibank, whatever. And then once the, once the bank receives your money, they, they take your money and they use it every night. And they lend it out at the federal funds rate. And they make money with your money. The average dollar that you put into your bank account is lent out seven times by your bank before you ever touch it. And just a quick accounting, can, can anybody recall the last time your bank paid you for the use of your money? No, yep, me neither. Um, most of the time, the only benefit we get from this is um, the bank will say, well, look, you've got so much money in my account, in your account right now, we're not gonna charge you to keep your money with us and let us use your money. That's uh, there's something in, inherently insidious about that thought process, and unfortunately, we as Americans have uh, have bought into that, and we believe that, and we're okay with it. Most of us are okay with it. I'm not okay with it. So finally, after they're done using your money, you decide that it's time to go ahead and pay that bill. And that bill is, let's say, it's your car payment. So you said, okay, Mr. Bank, please send five hundred dollars to the lender for my car, and you tell them to pay your debt. And they do. And now all the money, all of a sudden, where's your money? Your money's gone. Your money's your money got deposited into your bank account. Your bank lent it out seven times and made money with it. And then you told your bank to pay your lender or your creditor. And then your money became their money and your money's gone forever. And if you're super sweet and super nice and ask them, can I have my money back? They're not going to give it to you. It's gone. It's gone forever. What is your net? result. It's actually a net zero sum game. What happened was you traded $100 or $1,000 or $500 of your, your money to eliminate $500 maybe of your debt. It's probably less than that because there's interest being charged. So this is the way we are taught to do it. This is the way we've been doing it for years and years and years. And there's a huge problem with this, which is I've got my money, but it's working for somebody else. How do I put my money to work for me? Welcome to debt free life. So here's how that works. So you do the same thing. You make the same money, W2, W4, 1099, whatever. You, the money gets deposited, your income gets deposited into your checking account. Doesn't matter what bank it's with, it's in your checking account. Here's where the DFL program takes over. So at, remember, at its core, what is a DFL program? It's a, it's a whole life policy, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. Well, actually, we'll talk about it right now. What is it? It's a whole life policy. It's a specialized type of whole life, but it's still whole life. So you are going to write a check to your uh, life insurance company. And that check is going to go pay for that whole life policy. Now, when you write that single check and the carrier, whoever that is, receives that single check, they're going to separate the money in three different ways. They're going to, they're going to pay your whole life premium. They're going to pay a term life rider and they're gonna pay for paid up additional life insurance. That's how your money gets split three different ways. It's not equal. About 11% goes to pay for your term life rider. <clears throat> about 21% goes to pay for your whole life. And about 68% goes to pay for your paid up additions. <clears throat> Remember earlier where I said there is a hidden cash value that's your emergency fund? It's in your whole life. Of the 21% that you're putting into whole life, roughly half of it is gonna be credited as cash value to the account. So even though you're paying 21%, we'll say, we'll say, it's, we'll say your payment's hundred bucks. So $21 is paying for your whole life. $11 is being credited to cash value, okay? $11 is paying for term life. 
ten dollars is paying for whole wipes. Sixty-eight dollars is going to pay the petitions. Why? So the interesting thing about the way these programs are set up is that you're buying additional life insurance every time you make a premium. Okay, so that means the life insurance value of your program is growing, 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 growing. But the way that these carriers, this is a specialized type of whole life. We talked about this a second ago. It's called participating whole life. Participating means you get to participate with the profitability of the carrier. And the carrier, in order to use your money, is going to pay you an interest rate, a good interest rate, and a dividend on the money that you have in the program. So that participating whole life program is part whole life life insurance, part term life rider, mostly paid up additions, but all of it is still life insurance. So here's a, here's a critical concept to get. So this goes and in, feeds into the IRS tax code, which says all money derived from a life insurance policy is tax exempt, okay? So if we're buying additional life insurance, and the life insurance is growing, that's great. That means our family is gonna have a heck of a legacy. These carriers allow us and treat that paid up addition and allow us to consider that paid up addition as cash, meaning it gets applied a guaranteed interest rate. It gets applied a dividend. You can use it as collateral to borrow against. And this comes back to that term life piece. So as the cash value grows in the program, the IRS says, they're looking at it. And when the term life, excuse me, not term, when the cash value of the program exceeds what the life insurance value is, then the IRS is going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not a life insurance policy. That's an endowment contract. And because it's an endowment contract, the whole thing is taxable. That's what they're going to do. So the reason why we have that term life rider in there is because it's creating this massive umbrella so that we can grow the cash underneath. And the cash grows fast, okay? About two years, 2.3 years reaches critical mass. So we wanna grow that cash value underneath. And then all of a sudden the term rider can go away when we don't need it anymore. The idea of that term life rider is to protect against the IRS from making this taxable and viewing this as an endowment contract instead of as a life insurance policy. So let's move on a little bit more. So we've got those three, we sent our money from our checking account up into our debt-free life, life insurance policy. And what we've really done is we've moved that circle where we get to use the money over and over again. We've taken it away from the bank and we put it onto our corner, which is really our private bank, which is our DFL bank. So what does that mean? I get to cycle through my dollars over and over and over again. Because what I'm actually doing is I'm not ever using my money. So if does a car lending company care whether the money came from my checking account and was derived from my income, or whether it came from my checking account and was derived as a benefit, a benefit or proceeds from a life insurance policy? They don't care. All they care about is whether or not they get their money. So if they don't care where the money came from, and I have the option to use somebody else's money versus use my money, I'm gonna use somebody else's money. And that's what a DFL program is designed to do. It's allowed, it's designed to build this cash value over time and use, use periodic withdrawals in the form of, of loans against the cash value and pay debts with it. And so if, I'm, if I pay my $1,000 in the last illustration, if I pay my $1,000 directly to my creditor, that money's gone forever. If I pay my $1,000 up into my private DFL bank and then take a loan for $1,000 and then pay my creditor, I've captured my money forever. And remember, compounding interest, right? And a dividend, right? And if I use that money this year, but all of a sudden and I pay down the loan the next year, I use it again, and then I use it again, and I use it again, and again, and again. This is what this is about, folks. This is about putting you in a situation where you're, the amount of money you're spending over time is going to be spent efficiently. So let's, let's finish out this process. So all of a sudden, I've got money in my bank, and it's time for me to make one of those payments. Let's say I'm going to make a $1,000 payment on my car. So I'm going to go ahead and tell my carrier to, to loan me $1,000. 
they're going to say, okay, you've got $2,000 in your bank. We're going to encumber $1,000 of it. And we're going to deposit that money back into your checking account. And then you write a check to your creditor, the car lending company, and they get paid $1,000. Your money is still in your private bank. Your bank, regular bank, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, whoever, they send the money off to pay your debt. Your debt gets paid. That money becomes their money, but your money is still earning an interest rate in your private bank, plus a dividend. This is the difference, the key difference between how you currently spend money and how a DFL program can show you to spend money. I'm not saying, and you can, but I'm not saying you do this to go out and, okay, well, I'm going to spend $90 on groceries this month, and I'm going to go put $90 off my bank. No, that's not. What, this is about elimination of real debt. That's a, that's a recurring debt that's never going to go away. This is about eliminating debt. You can use it for that. That's a different discussion for a different debt. So let's see how it actually works in practice. So this is a company, this is a, a young a family that I did one of these programs with about two years ago in October 2019. This is uh, incidentally, that was the first year this program was made available in all states in the country. Brand, very first year. Actually, that was uh, about six months after this program became available. So here's where they were. Uh, they had a lot of debt. Um, about $585,000 of true debt. That's because this was a blended family. They had, the, the husband and the wife had both been married before. They both had kids. They both had houses. So there's actually two properties involved here. The wife was a, at that time, a college doctoral student trying to get her PhD. She's since gotten it. And she had a tremendous amount of student loans. Student loans are evil people. She had a tremendous amount of student loans. And, uh, and they, have, they were on track to be debt-free in about 40 years. Great. That's the American dream, right? Not at all. So when I showed them this program, they went nuts, like most people do. Because this is, this is what we showed them. Your, your current debt of $585,000 is not really $585,000. Once you add in all the interest you're going to be paying over time, that's seven hundred sixty-seven thousand, one hundred eighty-two thousand dollars of interest. That's just that's just gone, blown money. Okay, so what if we can put you in a better way? So instead of being debt-free in forty years with zero to show for it, except for two houses that are fully paid off, which is still a lot, what if we do this? What if we get you out of debt in seven point eight years? That's how their program worked. Out of debt, seven point eight years, saved them seventy thousand five hundred dollars of interest. Went from 40 years to 7.8 years. That's that's a lot better than than uh, that's more than 30 years faster. Okay, and um, one of the common misconceptions about the way these programs work is uh, you've got all these debts: credit cards, student loans, car loans, personal loans, mortgages, those kinds of things, and they all have different interest rates. And the common concept is I just want to pay the highest interest rate thing off first. No, that is incorrect. And there is absolutely a best way and a best order to pay off your debts. And it is almost always not in order of interest rate. Okay. And here's a great example of that. So they've got an interest rate of credit card there that's 25.24%. They've got personal loans of 4.5%. Student loan of 0% because it's in deferment. Maybe federal credit loans. So if you look at that, the order that this program should be, should be working is the order is illustrated here. And you're gonna see 0% interest credit card things, 0% interest things that are gonna be paid off before the higher interest things are paid off. And the reason why is because this is a two-part program. It uses infinite banking and debt snowballing. What that other process is where you have the highest interest rate first and then the next one and the next one, that's called debt stacking. And debt stacking, I've only seen it once where it actually worked better than this. Or actually, the only time I've ever seen it where it was the same is uh, when it actually worked out where the highest interest rate was the first and so on and so on. And it is serendipity that that happens. It's coincidence. It is definitely not the way to go. So um, before you go out and try to do the math, I've done this. I've tried to do the math on my own. I spent 12 hours with different spreadsheets trying to figure this out. And until I got this software, this very expensive software to do it for me, wasn't coming close. So um, get with your professional. They've got the software. They spent the money for it. And, um, and they'll be able to, to run these illustrations for you. 
So where we are, remember, $584,000, $767,000 true debt. This was their family roadmap. This is where they were at the top, 40 years in debt, $182,000 in interest. Bottom left-hand corner, 7.8 years out of debt, saved $70,000 in interest. I don't know about you, but if you can save me $70,000 in interest, um, I'll, I'll spend some money. Even if it, even if it costs me $70,000 to do this program, which it doesn't, uh, to get out of debt in 7.8 years versus 40 years and have all the rest of that time to save and build and, and have retirement savings build up. So that bottom line, those two lines at the bottom of the page, that's really where the rubber meets the road with these programs. It is not about, uh, certainly the, the rate at which you become debt free is important. Certainly the amount of interest that you save is important, but the, the discipline of continuing to fund the program and build the program over time is what creates these massive, massive retirements. Where these folks were in 40 years, they were gonna be debt-free with the exception of, uh, with debt-free and their only asset would have been the equity in their homes. With this program, they were able to accomplish certainly that, but have the equity in their homes in 7.8 years. But more importantly, for that same 40 year run, they were able to build up or will be able to build up $4.8 million worth of cash that they can do whatever they want to do with. And even beyond that, this also creates a, a life insurance policy. Don't forget, at its core, it's still life insurance. And that life insurance policy, there's a $1.1 million life insurance policy attached to this that's fully paid up when they're done. They don't ever have to make another payment. This is the difference between retiring without debt and having the equity in your house and the reason why those reverse mortgages exist versus not caring about that, not worrying about that, not worrying about the money, not ever worrying whether or not you're going to outlive your savings. And certainly the creation of generational wealth. We're not talking about your, you know, your kids. I'm talking about these solutions can fund family legacies for three, four, five generations if you do it correctly. So one more thing, and then we'll move on to the next illustration. This is a, just a basic scenario. Um, this is 7.8 years. Each one of those yellow bars is a year where they pay off some debt. A couple of interesting things about this program, the way it works. In the very first year, they built up uh, enough cash in the program to take a loan from $14,915. It's a lot of money, okay? Which means they also paid off $14,915 of the debt. Now, the other interesting side of this is at the end, because they, they would have taken this debt and done the cycling, taken the debt, paid the debt, taken the debt, paid the debt. At the end of the year, they had taken the debt, paid the debt, taken the debt, paid the debt, to the point where even though they took out $14,915, they only owed $8,600 as the, as the loan at that point. And more importantly, they still had $12,000 liquid cash. So they took out 14,000, had a loan for 8,600, and they still had $12,000 left over. And that set them up for year two. Year two, take out 15,000. Now the loan, even with the new $15,000 of loans is now down to 7,700, but now they got 40,000 liquid in their program. And the next year, if we do the same, now this, savings balance column, um, these programs have a speed limit that you can build cash, okay? Remember that modified endowment contract we were talking about earlier? The idea is that we don't wanna exceed that speed limit or else the game's over. So on a regular basis, we're gonna be taking a loan or we're gonna have a, a requirement for us to put money into that other program so that we don't cause this program to become a modified endowment contract. So in year three, which is actually about year 2.5, remember what I was saying earlier, two point, about year 2.3 is when we reach critical mass. Yep, happened here too. So in that year, we were putting so much money into the program because of the debt snowball that the program was maximally funded. We couldn't accept any more money. So that $7,400 here in this column actually came out of our savings balance, which was a, a second DFL program, if you will, or just a plain old savings account. 
Um, why would you put money in a savings account that's going to earn 0.25% and something versus something you're going to get a dividend and a guaranteed interest rate that approaches 4%? Why wouldn't you do that? You wouldn't. That's why you should consider when you're doing these starting a second bank that you can convert when the time comes where, uh oh, we're going to Mac. Okay, instead of putting the money into a savings account, just start the other bank and put the money in there. Year four, the next debt, we're down to four debts in year four of the 18 or 20 that they started with. And the four debts in year four that we have that are left are a house, a house, a big student loan, and a big truck, uh, a semi. Uh, the, one of the owners here, is a, he's a tractor trailer driver. He owns his own semi company. So in this scenario, there wasn't enough money in that year, in year four, where we could pay off any one of those debts at once. What you should read between the lines is that means in that year, 91,000 is what we ended up with over the course of the year. So 91 times four is $365,000 roughly. So that means at that point in time, they still owed $365,000. Still a lot of money, but each one of those debts was too large to be able to pay off at one time. So that's why we paid off one of those debts year five, one of those debts year six, and then one of those debts in year 7.8, which shows up here as year eight. All right, so that's a family, how it will typically work for a family. One of the critical concepts to think about with this is that debt is not a bad thing. And um, the idea of getting rid of debt is, is excellent and we, and we wanna do that, but these programs work on turning debt on its head. So when I'm looking at a program where I've got someone who the only debt they have is a house, let's say they have $100,000 they owe on their house versus someone who's got six debts that owes 100,000, but only 80s on the house and 20s on five uh, credit cards or whatever. The, the one with the more number of debts is the one that's actually gonna work faster. Uh, traditionally, if, you, if all you've got is a mortgage, it's going to cut your mortgage in half. So if you've got a 30-year mortgage, it's going to cut it to 15. If you've got a 20-year mortgage, it's probably going to cut it close to 10. And that's still great, okay? But if you've got those additional debts that are able to build that debt snowball over time, it's going to work even better. All right, so let's move forward. So the next thing is, well, what happens if I don't have any debts? Well, everybody's got debt. So this is a student that I worked on the exact same day that year. Huh. Um, she was a master's student. She goes to Cal Poly right now. She's in the master's program. Actually, she probably finished. Um, this was a, um, uh, she doesn't matter where she is. Anyway, when I met her, she had a lot of debt. And the debt that she owed at that time was $85,000 through student loans, car loan, hospital bill. Student loans are evil people. So what we did with her, she was on track to again, be debt free in 40 years. Great, great idea, right? So our, our system here assumes a couple of things. Number one, we assume that the 23 year old that I wrote this program on is never gonna make more money than she makes right now working as a waitress, which is incorrect. Uh, we assume that she's always gonna fund it only at the minimum level, which is also incorrect. But these are things that give us the most conservative illustration. So in this, in this scenario, the conservative illustration for her was that she was gonna have $85,000 in debt, assuming she never incurs any more debt. And she, because of the nature of those debts, because the majority of it is student loans, the interest that she's gonna pay on those debts is actually $6,000 higher than what she owes, $91,000 in interest over time. So this is something that's close to my heart. Um, this is insane. This this whole idea of being able to go borrow and borrow and borrow and borrow is really, really, really a bad idea. And we have an opportunity to change that um, discussion and certainly change the direction of this young woman as we did for her for her the course of her life. So what we showed her was instead of paying all those debts over the course of 40 years, 9.7 years, still, that's 10 years, still a long time. But again, remember, we're, we're assuming she's never going to make more money than she's making now, which I know as soon as she gets her master's and gets that job, she's going to make three to four times what she was making as a waitress. Nothing wrong with waiting tables. I did it. Nothing wrong with it. Um, hard work. But three to four times what she was making as a waitress. 
is what's getting ready to happen. So she's going to be able to maximally fund this program when she wants to at will here shortly. And that's going to change that 9.7 years down to about 4.5, 5.5 years. So again, 40 years of interest, $91,000 of scheduled interest down to 9, 9.7 years and $64,000 of interest saved. But here's the coolest thing. Because of the way we structured this and what we did with the minimums and everything we set up for this young woman, she's gonna have $603,000 when she turns 60 years old, 63 years old. She can retire if she wants at 63, just through the use of this program. That doesn't count on social security. That doesn't count on any of the pensions. That's nothing. And if she did this, maybe she's got to, maybe she cycled through the dollars and bought a house at some point in the future, which she could do for this. It's a private bank. You can use it for however you want. But the important part is she has already set herself up to leave a legacy for her kids, grandkids. And she's also set herself up for a heck of a retirement. This is the way her, her program was uh, fleshed out. Again, this is just a $350 a month program. And this, she had an $1,100 uh, sitting in a CD at the time. That's why that first year's annual premium is $1,100 higher than the rest of the years. So she used that $1,100 to jumpstart a program, paid off some debts in year one. And then you can see how this works and how it flowed. She didn't reach critical mass with her program until the sixth year. That's the first year that we didn't, or we had an opportunity where we had too much money in going into the program and we had to pull money out of a savings account, or in this case, at that point, maybe she's married, maybe she's got another one of these things. I don't know. But the point is, is that this gave her, this has given her true freedom. And when I'm looking at this, she told me she wanted to retire at age 65. This program allowed her to retire at 55. At, at age 56, she's no longer paying premiums. And at that age, for not paying any premium from one year to the next, the program is earning $22,000 a year. That's huge. That's $22,000 of tax exempt income. That's the equivalent of the 35 or 40,000 a year taxable income. Now I know in 40 years, that's not gonna be a lot of money, but who knows? Maybe she does another one of these programs. I don't know, but that's how the program will work. So that's the basic illustration. Um, so at this point, what you should do is if you're, uh, if you're looking at DFL for yourself, you should get with whoever invited you and uh, have a conversation with them. Um, if you're an agent looking to learn how to do DFL, get with your up one, take the DFL class. The software I'm using here is our original software. The new, the new symmetry software is different. It's got some different key points. Um, I like both. Um, the symmetry software is a couple thousand dollars cheaper. So it's up to you guys. Uh, so what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Take a minute, take some questions if you got anything. We got nothing in the chat. Um, anybody got something? I see Mr. Helm is unmuted. I am. I have a lot actually, but it's very specific to illustrations I've run. You know, okay. with the DFL software, one of the things I'm running into a couple of times is what you mentioned about, you know, overfunding it. Uh -huh. And then having to put it into a, a, some other vehicle. Yep. So one of mine is as early as 2.9 years. So what do I recommend to that person then? Yeah, they got a family member? They do. Uh, yes. Start a term policy, fully underwritten term policy with the same carrier on that on that family member. And then convert that to a participating whole life when you need to start putting money into a new account. All right, I'm gonna say that that's over my pay grade already what you just said. It's so. a convertible term, you know? So with, with Foresters, you can, you can convert strong foundation, fully underwritten strong foundation into the Advantage Plus Two. With Mutual Trust, you can convert their 10, 15, 20, 30 year term into the horizon value. All you do is flip the switch. And then you say, well, how much do you want to convert it to? All, all of it. And then you figure out what the new premium is. And now you've got another DFL that they've already qualified for. They've already been through underwriting. They can't be declined and they can turn it on immediately. So the amount of overfunding would be the, the, the how much term it would pay for. 
Right. We do have to take into consideration where the snowball is going to be if you haven't completed the snowball. So if you're looking at the series of debts and the, the total minimum payment comes to $2,000 a month, and what you found that they were overpaying was $1,000 a month, that's $1,000 is what you're using to start your program. That $2,000 debt snowball is what's going to cause the program to fly once you get through critical mass. Okay. So you have to you have to look into the future and see what's going to happen. It's it, what you do once or twice. It's a pretty easy math to do. Okay, but you just have to look at two thousand dollars is what their minimum payment is on their debt service. Two thousand times twelve is twenty four. That means that you need to be able to capture twenty four thousand dollars of snowball money. And if the current program they're in only captures or has a maximum of say twenty then the, the convertible program needs to have at least 4,000 of PUA capture amount, of bank capture amount. Get it? I'm, I'm close. Okay. I would, I would need to repeat that to you to make sure that I understood it. But <laughs> All right. can I add? Go, can yeah, add go Tom, add? go. So, so, Rick, the way that I describe it to my clients is this. The, the first one we're setting up is a mean, lean, get out of debt machine. It doesn't have a lot of headroom for growth because it's just trying to chew through the debt and, and get as much of it moved in. You're going to get to a tipping point where you've moved so many of the minimum payments that you've been making to credit cards and other loans in-house that you're going to start hitting your head against the wall. That's the time to build a bigger bank. I think a little one is like a lean, mean drive through machine, and then you're going to build a bigger bank. Now, for me, I took out, a, um, I took out an IUL on myself. Uh, gosh, seven years ago. Um, and I have not been overfunding it. So that's going to actually be my overflow for my bank until I, until I max that out. Then I'm going to be going and getting, since I'm single, I'm going to be going and getting another, um, a, another uh, debt-free life with one of the other carriers so I can kind of you know, spread the wealth around. It's not uncommon for people to have two and three of these banks and covering multiple people in their family um, in order to do it. So, but does that make sense that the first is really, it's really fine tuned to get a handle on the debt as quickly as possible. And the second one is more about wealth generation and wealth building. And does that make sense, Rick? And what'd you say, Scott? And capturing the cash. Yep. Wealth capture. Rick, does that make a little bit more sense to you? It, it absolutely makes a little bit more sense. Okay. And then I understand how share, how you'd have to share the wealth because if let's say you like I already have on this one gal who's young and healthy, uh, the carry came back and said I had the lower on the flexible premium paid up addition. I had to lower the maximum amount, which had defaulted to 100,000. They said, you have to lower that because otherwise the 10 time factor would, you know, we'd have to underwrite her for significantly more. That's so I'm wondering if since I lowered that to get it approved, have I screwed her? No. Nope. No, you, you did the right, they gave you good advice. Okay. Um, you know, you, you're, you're trying not to put them on a treadmill and have them do EKG machines if you can avoid it. And that's what they were talking about is your, when you, when you aggregate the term with the whole life and the, and the PUAs and you add a multiple to them, it's getting to be the potential for this to grow to such a huge insurance policy is making them say, look, we want to, we want to check under the hood. We want to check in the trunk. You know, we want to check under the carriage. We want to check everywhere. So I've done this very same thing. And it's why you can have more than one of these, get the first one set up to the fine tune it to the best of your ability. The people we're working with at each of these companies have been well-trained. They know what they're doing. Um, so you didn't, you didn't screw, you didn't, you didn't mess anybody up. Um, okay. And the second one, you're going to build for size. And the you're second one, I'll do with a different carrier because they want to, you have to shift the risk around. Yeah. No, right. just I, no I risk. The, the, the carrier is based on what you're trying to do. There is one carrier that performs better than the others. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you, when you write it, there's no reason not to write that second program with the same carrier. The performance do it there for me. Is there. I'm going to do it for me because of my position. I want to have I want to have experience with each one of the carriers so that I can I can speak intelligently about them. 
that's why I'm going to do more than one care more. I'm going to spread the carriers as I will as well. I mean, I'm brands, but I, I'm getting these sold on my energy and my excitement because I really don't know what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> okay, hey guys, this is Tay. I, I, this is where my confusion comes in. That second policy, when is it written? At the time the original DFL or in the two year time period? I write them both at the same time. I'm not good enough to do that yet. I'm yes, so I'll, I'll do a, a term on, on, I'll do a DFL on the husband or the wife, and then I'll do a term, a convertible, fully underwritten convertible term on the other spouse or another family member, it doesn't matter, but make, make those two people the owner of the policy. And then when the, when the bank gets full, pick up the phone, call, hey, convert that term to a participating whole life, and then you're off to the races. Why is it important to get a fully underwritten term policy? Why is it important to get that right at that moment in time? Be because if it's not fully underwritten term, it's not gonna be convertible to a fully underwritten whole life. And what are we doing for our clients that may be two years, three years, four years down the road before we open up that second bank? What are we guaranteeing guarantee? their insurability? Yeah. Because they don't have to go through an, an exam if you're converting a, this term to a, to a whole life. You've already done that. Right. Okay. Um, I, got, I got a question. Sarah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so this spinoff that we make for uh, you know, so we make the money, goes in the checking account from the checking account, it goes into the whole life, the term life, and then uh, the paid up additions. Do we use that term life to spin off? Yeah, can, can nope. we do like that's, a, okay. that's that's one policy. The one okay. policy is three parts whole okay. life, term life rider, paid up addition. You can't separate it out. Okay. Okay. All right. I didn't know if we could use that one once it got full. To well, there is one carrier that allows you to write another term rider on another family member. Um, okay. So, you know, depending on how you're structuring and what you're looking at and where you're finding the funds to support this program, if you have someone who's got a, a term program that's going to expire in three years and they're paying $100 a month for it and they just want another 10 years of term coverage, then you can actually add on a 10 year term rider on that person, the spouse, and have that expand, use that as part of that umbrella to expand the capacity. But ultimately what you're doing is you're saving the client money because they're, they're still getting the, the coverage they wanted, but now you're, you're using that coverage for two different purposes. Not only are you using it for death benefit coverage, but you're also using it for, for PUA bank capacity. Sure. And they're paying rider prices instead of new policy prices. Right. Like that. Now and, it's not convertible. Sure. Sure. It's going to end. Because it's a rider, right? Yeah. Yeah. Jesse, when I do, when I do my financial analysis of clients, um, I'm definitely looking at what insurance they have existing because if when we're done building our bank, we're giving them more coverage than they already have. Why continue to pay on the coverage they have, put that money in the bank as well. It's going to work a lot. We're not doing it for the death benefit, but it's a happy, it's a happy side effect. It's a happy, happy sure. accident. Sure. And then you look, you know, legacy, legacy building. So Scott, I'm still unclear as to what the purpose of the 10 year term rider is for. If you don't put the 10 year term rider onto a DFL pro policy, you will not be able to have a PUA bank more than whatever your target premium is on your PUA bank. Because IRS tax code says no, no money is derived from a life insurance policy or tax exempt. It also says if the cash value of a program exceeds the life insurance value of the program, then the program is not life insurance. It's a modified endowment contract. That term life rider creates an umbrella of death benefit. Because remember, in the beginning, you don't have any PUA yet. Okay. So you have to build, you have to have this umbrella so you can build the PUA, which is it's cash, but it's also life insurance. That has to be able to grow so that you can get rid of this term wire at a later date. And then the program won't be a mech. And if you look at the illustrations, one key thing here is whenever you're structuring these, if you're going to use and choose a reduced paid up age where the, where the client's no longer going to pay into the program, you need to let the term rider run one year longer. That will that will force the program not to mech. That's just a... Oh, I'm going to have to learn that software trick then. Okay. So, 
so Rick, again, uh, this is all built into the software and, and working with the different carriers. They're well, they're well trained with this, but think of it like this. In the beginning, as much money, like I have a client who, who could potentially want to load $20,000 up front into this. He needs to have a pretty big umbrella. There's two, two ways you can do that with whole life or term, which is more expensive to the client. Whole life. Right. So if you can do it with term and save them that money, you only need it for a certain number of years before your bank has gotten big enough to handle everything. And then you can just let it expire. It's just a, it's an inexpensive way to give your, give your client more headroom uh, to grow that bank early on to let the compounding take over and, and have better, better results down the road. All right. I hate to hog up all the questions. I have more. Uh, let's just see if anybody else has any, because you're asking good questions, Rick. Anybody I have else? One more. I, I have one more too. Um, so I was telling somebody about the idea of this and I, I'm still learning quite a bit as Scott knows, cause he's my upline, but um, how is it unaffected by the market? I mean, we're getting these growths and we're getting these gains, and these percentages, but is, aren't the companies using the same investments? The, as the growth the is, the guarantee, is a guaranteed growth. The, the, the interest rate, the, the guaranteed interest rate is guaranteed by contract. And then the additional contract. interest on the dividend is how well the company performs. None of that has anything to do with the stock market. Okay. So they're guaranteed by contract. Yep. Okay. By the way, Thank Jesse, you. you're in great hands if you can't tell. I, I'm super blessed. Super blessed <laughs> to be on Scott's team. Amen. Absolutely. Hey, Scott, Tom, I uh, got a question. Brett Desario, good to meet you in Virginia. Hey, Brett. Awesome. Hey, Brett. Yeah, going? it was good to meet you down there. Kelm, you too, also. Um, I'm in Florida, so I'm up there. <laughs> uh, quick question. When you come across a concept where people are you know, trying to explain this to people and it's a whole life product that's built in, and you, say you start off because you want something that's just going to, like you said, get that traction, get them going, Tom, um, and you say, I'm going to start you guys off with, say, it's a husband and wife. And you get the, the husband the whole life and you get the wife the term. They say, well, I don't want that term product. So how do you explain it to them that way? Like, how do you get them to say, oh, I get it now. That makes more sense to me. What I do is I, we, we establish the budget by looking at the money that we're going to redefine, that we're going to be using. Because this is supposed to be a zero cost program. Okay. So if the money that we come to is $255, I look at what the spouse's term rider is going to cost 10, 15, 20 bucks. It's going to be cheap. Okay. I'm going to subtract that from, and I'm going to make the whole package a zero cost package. Okay. So for me, Brett, when I'm going over that, that schedule that, that Scott went over that has lots of lines and yellow lines on it and all that, there's a column that begins to get populated when, when you open up the second account. And I, I use my lean, mean, get on a debt machine analogy. And I say, yeah, I like that. What, once that's maxed out, you have this extra money you have to put somewhere. And to be quite honest with you, it's up to you. We really don't care where you put the money. You can put it in a savings account. You can stuff it in your mattress. You can bury it in a coffee can in your backyard. However, you know, why wouldn't you want to put it back into one of these to, that's going to grow even, even more and even further? So I leave the choice up to them and 99.99999% of the time right off the bat, they're like, well, why wouldn't I do this? So it's because it gives them the liquidity, it gives them the safety, uh, it gives them the tax-free status, it gives them the protection from uh, uh, tort, uh, tort. I mean, it's, it, it's superior in every way to any other place you can put the money um as far as as far as it goes but i like to let my client make that decision themselves um right. and and then like scott says i just i'm getting uh, i i i have been i've been deferring that until the time is needed and scott has re-educated me and it didn't hurt too much um on on the on the need to do the to do the uh, fully underwritten term at the same time to make sure that the client has is as guaranteed insurability for Stability. the product and, and man, what a lesson did we learn this last year with COVID because, you know, all, all your client needed to do was get COVID and, you, and they were, there was a moratorium on anything insurance to them for 90 days. Yeah. So, you know, Lord knows what else could come down the pike, but 
but Scott's really edu re-educated me on that. And, and I, that's now part of my strategy, but I, I let them make the decision as to which way to go. One last question for this, uh, for this training you did today, Scott, um, this is for anybody or any potential clients we might have to want to learn about DFL also, is that true? Yeah, this is a forward facing presentation with the Q and A session. So the idea is that the first segment of this was the, what should be your first presentation to your client? Mm -hmm. Okay. Kind of like corporate overview. It's a it's a corporate overview. Yeah. For, for DFL. Like corporate overview, but, but with DFL. Yeah, kind of. Sure. And then this is this is more training and QA for anybody else who's looking at doing one of these. And if you don't already have one of these and you're a licensed agent, you're you're missing the boat. Because yeah. you should be you should be doing one of these for yourself if for no other reason than just to capture and sequester your quarterly taxes. Yeah, I agree um, with that one. Well, I think it works for that one. <laughs> Brent, I actually have one of my one of my close friends and clients on on the call tonight. And I'm ecstatic because I've been trying to get him on here for quite some time. And he's a busy man. So it's it's good to have him on. So and I appreciate Scott making it making it available. Sure. So yeah. Any more questions? I got one more thing I'd like to show you guys if we have a minute. Go ahead, Rick. All right. So I have a client that we're just this close to getting approved. And she's the one that I had to reduce the maximum amount on the uh, paid up edition rider. And she just found an extra 12 grand that she wants to plow into this thing. Right. And we can do that. What's your, what's your FPA ceiling? Well, the ceiling is the uh, 12 times the uh, paid up addition. Like, the, like, can't do it, huh? No, it's not 12 times. There, there's there's going to be a specific number that is your maximum contribution. I, I had to put a specific number down of $12,000 for her. No, I'm sorry. I'm mixing up with another one. She's got the maximum 100000 Then, yeah. So, no people. problem. She can plunk that in there. Yeah. Just do it. Hey, make, make, Scott. Make, sure, make sure you're talking to the the carrier, the people at the carrier, just to double check everything. Is you know, Scott and I are making recommendations here without looking at the actual numbers. Right. So make when sure. I talk to the carrier, I'm not talking to the underwriters who not necessarily no. clued into what's going on. I need to talk to the salespeople. Absolutely. The sales desk sales has been desk. trained on this. And why if it hasn't been issued yet, you can still modify the illustrations and do what you want to do. And I would say, I don't know. $100,000 PUA capacity, that's a very, very large PUA capacity for someone who's doing this. So that I, I'm assuming there, this is a business DFL. If it, not, it's it not. Be that large. It's not a business. It's the very first one that I did. Okay. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that you need to go back in and look at that illustration. Because if you've got $100,000 PUA capacity, unless they're spending $5,000 a month, then, then they're never going to need that much. She's spending eighteen hundred and seventy-seven a month. Um, mine's yeah, I, I, you probably have a little bit too much term rider in there, which is what's making that PUA capacity go up higher. Mine, mine is, my personal one is a little bit less than that, Rick, and I believe my PUA capacity is up around thirty-five thousand. I wanted to have some room for you know when yeah. this just takes off to plow more money into All it. right. Should I change it then? What, what's my so what you're do So by doing what you've done, you've given her a lot of capacity, which is great, okay? But you've given her something that she's probably not going to use. Which in cool. order to do that, you're spending money on term to make the PUA go higher, okay? Which is, which is an inefficient way to spend the money. I would consider manipulating it so that more money is going into PUA, less is going into term. And you can bring that PUA capacity down to 40, 40,000 and then spend that money because you're spending money on that term wider to make the PUA go higher. Spend the money you would have been spending on that term and have it go directly to PUA. It's gonna make her program work more efficiently. It's, it's the concept of the lean mean get out of debt machine. You, you, you haven't built a lean mean one, you built a, an airport hangar. Uh, size one rick i'll tell I you know. what because we got so many people on here i don't want to get into like that that minutia of it Ag if agreed you, if you want to you and i can set up a zoom i would be happy to take a look at it um with you okay super michael um did you have a, a question i thought you did i saw a hand up in the, you in the first row blue shirt yes 
I do have a couple of questions. Um, first, what what's in place to keep and triggers are in place to keep it from going into a mech? How is the client notified? The with, when you write the application, they're gonna they're gonna require her whenever or anybody whenever it's going to mech, they're gonna require a signature on a document that says, I know it's going to mech. I understand the tax implications of becoming a mech. I agree to allow it to mech. So the carrier is not going to allow it to happen unless, unless the owner of the policy agrees. So, Michael, so if we got to that point where in your illustration, you were showing the first two years that it was being funded and then th year three, you had to fund to a, an alternate account. What's to trigger that client to know to fund that alternate account? I have $20,000 in debt I'm trying to pay off. I have $17,000 uh, in my account. I need to take $3,000 that I couldn't put into my account. It, so the it, onus falls back on the client. Yeah. Well, the client and you, but, but Michael, I've got, I've got an experience with um, National Life Group uh, with one of my clients. They, they did a smart start on a kid and, and the market took off like a shot. Now this is market driven interest. So completely different, but they called us and said, you can't make any more premium payments this year or it will mech. So they're, they've got some business intelligence built into this too. So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a combination. You wanna be vigilant about it. I mean, you want, you want the client to take ownership of it, but you also are there to help. Right, Michael, sense? and I didn't, did I answer your question? I may have misunderstood your question. Are you asking about how you determine when you're going to pull money from a second bank? Or are you asking about when you're going to turn the second bank on to become another DFL? Well, no, more what Tom had answered was, okay. you know, what's, what, what are the triggers in place to, to prevent that to happen? I'm, I'm just thinking of the, of the standpoint of, you know, a client going down the road in their day-to-day -day life and they don't even realize that this has happened and then all of a sudden it blows up on them. It's a non-issue. It won't happen. They have to, if you've structured it right, they have to do what Rick is talking about. They found 20 grand and they want to put it in and they're not going to put that in without talking to you or without talking to the carrier and the carrier is going to go, wait a minute, hang on, let me do some calculations here. I had a client that liquidated a, a 401k, $28,000 last June, they decided they wanted to fully fund their DFL program, which they had had in place for three months at that point, but we only built in capacity for $30,000 because they didn't tell me they were going to do that. So they got the $28,000 deposited into their checking account, wrote a check for $28,000 to the carrier. The carrier cashed the check and sent them a check back for $612 because their account couldn't take anymore. And I got another question, Scott. So I'm going to set one of these up, you know, with you. Um, but I have a 401k and I, I have a feeling a lot of people want to talk to you. What's that? I'm sorry. <laughs> so because that's what I knew of investments, uh, you know, up to age 33. And so if I take that out, is that a I can't remember what the, the tax number yeah, is. Yeah, you're gonna if you try to take money out of a 401k at your age, you're gonna be super penalized unless you can take it under the CARES Act right now, which has not been eliminated yet. And in order for you to take it under the CARES Act, you're gonna have to prove a COVID hardship. All right. I well, I mean, we all had it, so I don't know, maybe figure something it's up out. To you, man. So when you take it, you're you're under the age of um, you're not at the age yet where you can take money out of your 401k. So right. was it, is it a qualified money or non-qualified money? Is it money you pay taxes on already or is it money you have to pay taxes on when you pull it out? Money I have to pay taxes on when I pull it out. And you're going to 20% plus pay tax plus pay income tax on it. So okay. this is not, this may not be the best instrument for you. Talk to your, talk to your, uh, your, your expert right there about it there's some other ways we other ways i would probably handle that yeah um, you should roll this, that into a private pension annuity and have that be the beginnings of your annuity stacks which you should yeah. derive from your dfl program which i can what from my dfl program you're gonna there's a there's a a financial distribution model that you can use a dfl to create it's called a private pension annuity stack 
Okay. So you're, you're stacking one on top of the other on top of the other. And you have them coming to realization or fruition at different points in time. So you can have that be your first part of the stack, whatever you've got, just roll over your annuity into it. And then start a DFL program and then take $10,000 of your DFL program at, at regular periods of time and create another annuity, another stack component of your stack. That's a different discussion for a different day. Yeah, Jesse, okay. Scott went over this about six, six or eight weeks ago. I am still putting my head back together again from the explosion <laughs> that occurred when he showed that to me. I, 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 I'm, that was mind boggling to me. I mean, several things you've shown me, Scott, have been mind boggling. That one is probably the one I'm having the biggest trouble wrapping my head around. So Jesse, please talk to, he's got a lot, he's got a lot of knowledge for you. I'm, I'm pumped. I'm excited to do it so I can learn it. So, yeah. So um, any other questions, Donna, you, you unmuted a little while ago. Um, was there anything you wanted to throw out? No, I, I have access to Scott. I'll catch him later. Okay, gotcha. Um, right, well, normally I would have done one advanced market thing tonight, but we don't have time, so maybe next time. What was the one advanced market thing you wanted to do? Uh, I was doing a, the home equity, uh, the home escrow funding. Okay, so briefly, it's using your bank. Okay, let me, Scott, let me ask you a question. Do you have a mortgage on your house? Yeah. Okay, do you have to pay taxes and insurance on that? Yeah. Do you have a choice between whether you pay that on your own or you have escrow, have it escrowed throughout the year? I don't know. I have a conventional loan. Which, what kind of loan do I have to have? Yeah, a conventional loan should have, should have um, the ability to escrow it or for you to pay it out of pocket. Right. Um, when, you, when you have it escrowed and it's building up over the year, how much does your mortgage company give you in interest on that money? Zero. Why? Oh, they're making money. They're keeping the money. So is, how do you feel about that? I'm a little angry. Okay. But what hey, I don't I have to write that one check. What if I could show you a way? Yeah, you don't have to write that one check here. What if I could show you a way that you get to keep the interest on that money and still make your payments? Does that look something like what you've got up on your screen? Uh, you know what? I've been preparing that all day today. Wow. That's a great idea, Tom. Tell me more. <laughs> you know what? There's somebody else who actually knows it better than me. Let me hand the mic over to him. Here it is. This is simple. When you're making your taxes, this is a real client of mine. Their, their payment was $1,700 a month, of which they were paying $478 a month of taxes and interest. They had a conventional loan. So what they were spending was $5,738, a year on taxes and interest. They were writing the checks, sending it to their mortgage company. Their mortgage company was taking the money, investing it for themselves, paying the taxes and insurance, when they needed to, and keeping the interest that they earned. So what I propose is this. Instead of you paying your mortgage company, pay yourself. Put the money up into your DFL program, fifty-seven thirty-six per year. That, with the interest that you're going to gain, yeah. means at the end of the first year, you're going to have fifty-nine sixty-five. Now, in the first year, you will lose money. It's going to cost you $45, Jesse Baker, to capture $5,965. You don't have to, you can keep the 45 bucks and not capture the 5965, but the 5965 is gone forever. And in the second year, the program is then profitable. In the second year, you've got your plus 195. Third year, you're plus 432, and then so on. And if you run it long enough, 17th year, the program becomes enough where just the interest taxes and the interest that you're earning on this is enough to pay your taxes and insurance payment on your house. Not to mention, at the end of the 15th year, you've got $120,000 sitting in that account. And you probably don't have a mortgage, but you still have to pay the insurance and the taxes. It's always going to be paying the taxes and the insurance. If you don't have a mortgage company, they, there's no escrow. You're going to be stroking the checks yourself by then anyway. Yep. So what you're saying is, I'm going to let my lender continue to pay my taxes and escrow payment for me. I'm going to lose $4,495 a year to do that, but I don't have to write that one check. She saved me from writing two checks a year. That's, yeah. that's, a, pretty, that's a pretty fair trade-off. Yeah, it's $2,250 a check. All the anyway, math makes Tom, sense. If you want to do this, Tom, I'll, I'll do it for $2,000. You pay me $2,000, I'll write the two checks for you. 
What a deal. Okay. There you go, Rick. All, your all the math makes sense to me except for losing 45 hours the first year. Uh, that's because there's an interest rate that's taken on the loan. So every time you take you put the money in, but every time you take a loan, there's an interest rate and there's a delta. There's there's a you're being charged more slightly more in more on the interest than you're being paid on the guaranteed return. So there's a delta. So you're saying this is the guaranteed four percent. This has nothing to do with any dividends. Yeah, I didn't compute the dividend. So there could potentially be more on this. There could. Okay. How? When's the last time these companies didn't pay a dividend? Oh, they've they've always paid a dividend. Never more than never years? not paid a dividend. Okay, hundred years, two hundred years. How long are we talking? Uh, hundred and hundred and twenty years for one of them. Okay, and the average dividend in the last twenty years has been roughly. Don't deal in averages because it's it's entirely dependent on the market and how well okay. they do. I can say okay. that the lowest I've seen is 025 percent. Okay. And the okay. highest I've seen is eight point one one percent. Okay. Fair enough. Does that make sense, Rick? Okay. And that's 8.11 or 0.25 on top of the 4%. Yep. Well, there's there's some more math here that we're not showing because this is just fast math. There is a cost. There's First off, there's a loading fee, which is a one-time fee. Anytime you load money into the program, it's 6%. That's not taken into consideration here. Uh, but what we do consider here is that the cost, the loading fee cost is absorbed by your regular monthly payments. This, you don't set this program up just to do this. You cannot use money for your home escrow, uh, for, your, for your homeowner's insurance and your taxes. You cannot use that as a primary funding strategy for a DFL. This is a secondary use of a DFL. It has to be because the DFL has to be solvent. If you use this as a primary funding strategy, the, the DFL will fail. So you can't use it as a primary. So this is like me at a buffet uh, letting out the, 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 the button on my jacket to make sure I can get a little bit more in. Right? There you go. Okay. Right. So, so Scott, you mentioned this is taxes and, and, and escrow. Yep. What about someone who's self-employed that has to pay Uncle Sam on, a, on, a, on an annual basis? Off to the races, baby. Okay. Yep. Sign not, me a up. Primary, not a primary function. Cannot be primary, cannot be a primary funding source, can only be an add-on funding source. But if, if your primary funding source is 100 bucks a month, and then you're trying to put $5,000 a quarter in there, it's still not going to work because yeah. the, the primary funding source is not building, it doesn't have enough gas to, to be able to absorb the loading fee. So it's, it's got to be a substantial DFL program, 200, 300 okay. a month minimum target. Where, where's the easy math to determine when it's a good idea? Can uh, I answer that? Can I answer that? Yeah, go ahead, that? Tom. Okay, pick me. <laughs> if you can put one together for a client that makes sense without it, it makes sense with it. And the only time it wouldn't, Scott, is if it, it happens to be a really small DFL case. Is that about right, Scott? Yeah, so the magic number is about 10%. So whatever their annual taxes are, if their annual taxes are, say, $40,000 a year in taxes, 10% of that is $4,000. So their program needs to have an annual PUA funding just to the normal premium of at least 10% of whatever the tax amount you want to use. That will be a program that won't fail, but it's not going to grow fast either. Well, other than the fact that you're putting $40,000 a year, sequestering $40,000 a year into your program. So in year two, it becomes a little easier because the loading fee from year one is paid and absorbed. Question. Uh, we have a client tomorrow. My wife and I are going to see for a second DFL appointment, actually showing them illustrations. The husband is over the age of getting any type of insurance. I think he's 87. So we're going to put everything into the wife's name. You guys suggest starting with the term, uh, term policy, and then possibly adding what you guys just talked about or just doing the whole life? Um, if you're doing a DFL and you're doing it on the wife, you don't do the term on the wife, you do the DFL, right. which is the participating okay. whole life with the term rider. And then add and then add on what you guys just talked about with the tax and everything. Put that as like a bonus funding. You need to do the math and make sure okay. you, you know. 
And make sure you got your E and O insurance in order. What was that? Make sure you got your E and O insurance in order. Okay. Yeah, I would call some. I would Symmetry has a business department that does stuff like this now that can help you. I would I would consider reaching out to them if you're going to use this as a potential. I mean, you should tell people about this. It'll work. You just have to make sure the funding is right in the in the beginning. Right. I would have another. I would get another pair of eyes on this until you've done forty or fifty of these. Okay. Yeah. Brett, are, you I, are you available tomorrow at one thirty? <laughs> um, Scott, I just would interject. I guess if the husband is eighty-seven, I think you said. How old is the wife? All right, hold on one second. I'm going to stop the recording.